Whale? Are we live? I think we are, James. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, we're good. Cool. I love how this sneaks up on you sometimes. And well, it's sneaking away. Oh, and yep, it's back. Yep, we're Yay! Good. All right, we're good. <laughs> okay. For many patients, healthcare feels like a factory that whitewashes problems with pills or delivers uh, one size fits all solutions like surgery. I'm Dr. Donish, uh, an anesthesiologist and double board certified pain regenerative specialist. And I'm uh, the, the, guys, this is, this is a terrible take. <laughs> <laughs> we can't not take this live. <laughs> I know, right? All right. I'm going to try this again. I'm Dr. Donish, a native Kentuckian and the medical director of Wellward Regenerative Medicine. As a Hopkins trained, double board certified anesthesiologist and regenerative pain specialist, I believe it's time to revive the caring spirit of healthcare and offer you the patient the healing that you deserve. This Fifty Shades of Pain show is one way we empower you to receive sustainable treatments for injury and pain without surgery, addictive medication, and without being a victim of a system designed to work against your healing. I encourage you to start your healing journey at wellwardmed.com. Today I'm with Dr. Escaloni, uh, my co-host, who serves as a physical therapist, movement specialist, and physician extender at Wellward Regenerative Medicine. Uh, like me, he's seen a lot of patients who have endured hardship and uh, excessive pain, not because of lack of caring doctors, but because They've been struggling against a system that has fractured and been broken. So, James, what are we talking about today? Glad you asked. We're going to be talking about the one thing that people may be missing in making sure that their regenerative medicine actually is the most successful and optimized it could possibly be. Good God, James, <laughs> what kind of a treatment plan is this? <laughs> I love that he's asking and his enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we're going to be talking about is something called collagen protein. So, why is this so important? This is not only going to be helpful for the people who have any sort of regenerative medicine treatment, but even if you're pre-regenerative medicine, you've got something like patellar tendinopathy, Achilles tendinitis, tennis elbow, all that stuff. This could be helping you out, and if you're not taking it, you could be missing out on either a big chunk of your recovery or a full recovery in some cases. All right, what's so special about this protein? Okay, so you guys at home, you probably have heard about protein. You think, oh, bodybuilders, they take protein, they live off protein. They practically breathe protein in. That's usually whey protein. Milk. Exactly. We're not talking about that. We're actually talking about collagen protein, hydrolyzed collagen specifically, which, believe it or not, is quite terrible at building muscle. Yeah. Yeah. What, where do you find this? You can get this in a couple of places. You can get it on the store, online, co hydrolyzed collagen. Well, I meant where are they getting the collagen protein? Oh, where are they getting the collagen protein? Yeah, where do you have collagen in the body, first of all? Okay. Like, what is collagen? Gotcha. Collagen is part of the building blocks for a lot of our major joints, tendons, ligaments, things along those lines. It's kind of the matrix that makes it so it can differentiate and hold itself into a tighter tissue. So the tendon, all this stuff, a tendon meaning a muscle attaching to a bone, that element that holds everything tight, most of it is a type of collagen. Hmm. And so if you're going to be able to have those cells do their job or recover from an injury, it's usually helpful to have those building blocks floating around. So what what does collagen do in the body, first of all? Like when it and I understand that it's in the tendons, mm -hmm. but what's its function in those tendons? So what it's gonna be doing is it helps to create something called an extracellular matrix. So what that is, is just, instead of thinking about a tendon as this flat 2D thing, it's a big 3D element kind of looking like this. And so it allows it to have greater amounts of space, resiliency, stretchiness, and the ability to withstand some of that stretchiness because of its three-dimensional shape. Right, so like in your body, if, if you're doing, you know, let's say I'm lifting a jug of milk, what does is, what is a tendon do versus what does a muscle do, and why is collagen important? Okay. So when you've got a muscle that's contracting, you're going to be having these portions of the muscle, this tissue, that are going to be moving from point A to point B, creating force and moving it so you can move a bone. What a tendon does is this is going to be allowing it, so all this force that's generated in that big muscle can actually start to be pushed big onto muscle. that tendon. Oh, no. oh, there you go. <laughs> it can start to move toward 
towards this area of the tendon where it can actually start to condense the force that's being created in your muscle to allow it so that you can move this bone in an optimal way that works with the joint around it. So it's like the rubber band that connects the engine, which is the muscle, to the bone, which is the thing that's moving. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if, if there isn't good collagen, what happens? Well, let's use that example. If you have a regular brand new rubber band that's stretchy all day, well, take that rubber band and just keep on doing this all day, every day, maybe leave it out in the sun a little too long, it's a little cracked, frayed. It doesn't do exactly what it's supposed to. What I mean by that is it's not going to transfer the force the same. It's going to start to break down, and maybe it's going to start to have some of these spots that crack. And so well, if you're a human and you're having that same thing, well, you're not going to have that joint be as optimal with its performance, obviously. But also, if something's cracking and breaking, that's where pain can sometimes yeah. be. And so that's one of the elements that we're going to be looking out for when we're trying to help somebody with regenerative medicines and different types of therapies here. Yeah, I oftentimes I'm looking under an ultrasound machine and I put the probe on somebody's uh, tendon or muscle and I'm seeing these large gaps inside of there. And I'm thinking to myself, well, how did this even start to begin with? And it makes perfect sense for collagen to be an underlying issue because if, if the rubber band that connects your muscles to your bones has gotten brittle and, and kind of crackly, then the moment you go to move that muscle or put on a level of stress that your body's not tolerant of, what's gonna happen? It's gonna break and you're gonna leave, you're gonna have cracks left in that, in that area. Mm -hmm. So why is it that those cracks don't get filled up? Well, what happens, there's a couple things. One, is that you, as you get older, you don't have the same ability to use circulating collagen to rebuild itself. Just we don't rebuild ourselves the same as we did when we were younger. Sometimes there can be dietary elements uh, that we're not taking enough from the universe so that when we're eating food that collagen is not in there so that we can't rebuild that from there. There's not enough supply. But another element is it's really hard to target that tissue. Mm -hmm. And so we'll get into that a little bit but talking about something called stress shielding and how tendons can actually be healed with that is going to be really important for why the collagen can be utilized, but in a special particular way. Yeah, and especially I find when I, when I can see it under ultrasound, I can see that there's substance there. It's just not the same as the rest of the tendons around there. And what I think is happening is you've got like fibrous scar tissue that builds inside of those and just becomes an obstacle to your body layering down new healthy tissue. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's if you've had any experience with that. Like uh, you, you've explained the stress shielding to me before, but I think that's a really important concept. Mm -hmm. Can you can you explain it again? Oh yeah. So when somebody has an injury, what happens in a perfect world? Here is this tissue. Let's say this is tendon attaching to bone. Boom! I'm injured. Okay, the immune system responds to them. <laughs> yeah. Delayed good. reaction. <laughs> well, good inflammation kicks in, and it starts to eat away at the stuff that's... Wait, 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 wait. Inflammation is good? Yes. <laughs> there are good parts to inflammation. Yeah. So the good inflammation comes in there to start that repair process. Starts to eat away at some of these so that the bad stuff that's broken down goes away, and then your body starts to build it back up where it was again on various stages of being inflamed. And then this is what it's supposed to look like in a perfect world. Now let's say we all don't live in a perfect world. Imagine that. You have this injury. Ouch! There we go, delayed again. So the injury comes in. And then what happens from a regular real life situation? We keep on moving, we keep on doing stuff. And this gets partially recovered and it gets scarred down enough, and your body says, ah, good enough. Good We've enough. got to survive. We've got to run away from elephants. We've got to survive that 5 o'clock deadline, whatever. And that's my usual day. I don't know about you guys. But Running from elephants? Crazy times. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is what is left over. It's still good. This is still very good, viable tissue, but it's not as original as it used to be. And this is just from one incident. So this happens again and again over time until all of a sudden, all it can stand, and it can't stand some more. Ouch! Yep, big time pain. And it doesn't have the ability to recover like it used to. And that's usually what happens as we start to get an injury. 
Yeah. Now, as this starts to build up from a good recovery, this is the stuff that you're seeing under the ultrasound. This is how there's some of it that's still pretty good, but the rest of it's scarred and beaten down. Now, what we were talking about a second ago is something called stress shielding. Anytime that you guys are out there doing anything, moving around, jumping around, your body is trying to get around this normal mechanism of all these injuries to try to get it so that you're using the best tissue as possible to not re-injure this. So that makes it so the force goes around that area that's injured in a quick contraction. That's normal. It's supposed to happen like that. But, but it still hurts. Yeah, it still hurts. And so part of the problem is if all this force that goes around it doesn't actually contact the tissue, mm -hmm. well, if we're trying to do something like therapeutic exercise that can load it and remodel it, well, it never gets to it. It just hurts. Yeah. And then what does everybody do if something hurts? Stops doing it. Exactly. You know, so that tissue never gets the love that it needs. Yeah. Throw into it as we get older, there's not enough collagen around, and oh, that's going to happen. This keeps on getting worse and worse and worse, and it degrades over time. So the tissue doesn't get the love that it needs? Yeah. So can we call you a tissue lover? Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are so, terrible jokes. <laughs> hey, I, I'm enjoying this. This is good. Hopefully you guys at home appreciate it too. So with collagen, some of the cool stuff about this is this has already been researched. Much, much smarter people than me have figured this out. They figured out that one example was a study that came out in 2018. They looked at rats and they gave them big boluses of collagen with vitamin C. That's a big important part, collagen with vitamin C. They found out that if they did a surgical repair to rat Achilles tendons and then they sewed them all together again at three weeks, they had all the cellular alignments and growth factors to actually promote much more repair than the group that did not have that huh. just because it was in the system. Now, is rat collagen different than human collagen? A little bit. It's got a good similar model to it. So smarter people than me also thought the same question. So they said, what if we actually just did this in humans? What would happen? Great question, you guys. I'm glad you're thinking of this one. Here's how it went. They actually took these people with Achilles tendonitis, and they took them in a group and said, let's take you guys and do all that therapeutic loading, the tissue loving, mm -hmm. and let's give them some hydrolyzed collagen. And let's see what happens for this other group. And we'll just give them this exercise because we know this exercise will help them. This other group had a 40% greater improvement in the same period of wow. time in their ability to move, their pain, and actually in the density of the tissue viewed under ultrasound. So even when it heals, I mean, both groups might get a, get a healing outcome, mm -hmm. but one group is going to have a stronger tendon than the other one does. Yep. So... A lot of people who get that recurrent injury, we could actually get ahead of this with, with doing the appropriate type of nutrition with the appropriate type of exercise. Exactly. And a really cool thing, one of my favorite studies on this, came out looking at an NBA basketball player. So think about all you guys at home. Think about how an athlete goes, a professional athlete, how they get beaten up. Over the course of a season, they're going to get worse and worse and worse. And that's why the nickname for people in the NFL is not for long. <laughs> you get beaten up. You last a year or two, you're done. Because, well, you got somebody the size of a truck coming at you every single day. Your body gives way. So what they did with this one guy was they noticed he had really bad patellar tendinopathy. That stops you from jumping. You can't jump as an NBA player, you're done. And so what they did with him was they did heavy isometric loading. What does that mean? Isometric loading, good call. This is basically where you're having a muscle contraction, not just like this, but you're taking it and you're holding it here, and it's not moving at all. And they hold it for about 30 seconds, and what happens from that? All of a sudden, that stress shielding causes stress relaxation, and all that. So, the, sorry, the stress shielding is on. That's the healthy tendons. Mm -hmm. They're shielding the unhealthy tendons from seeing the stress. That's why I call it stress shielding. Yes. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what happens, the longer you hold that for about a 30-second period, being the best time frame, that went from a shielding to it actually relaxed that stress. Yeah. So that that injured area finally received that good load to actually start to remodel it. But they also gave them hydrolyzed collagen and vitamin C one hour beforehand. And why they gave it an hour beforehand is the tendon's different from muscle. Muscle gets a good blood supply, you need something, it's pushed into there, boom, good to go. 
dependence, the collagen in there, that has to be circulated into all of your bloodstream and it's just kind of floating through the universe until it gets near this area. And then at about an hour, that's when it's optimized at the highest point in the bloodstream. Hmm. So that way, when it starts to contract, you get that isometric floating now you've the got, stretch shielding. You've yeah. got all the Lego pieces that need to be there. Mm -hmm. And it can just float into there and it can build it back up again. That's cool. Now, what was even cooler, think about what I said. Over the course of the season, you're supposed to get more and more beaten up. This guy did this isometric loading protocol for a year and a half while still playing professional basketball. Huh. Think about how he's supposed to look. They did a follow-up MRI a year and a half later. They couldn't find any sort of injury. He was almost completely recovered. So it's almost like if you injure, like it's exercise is like miniature injuries to the body. So you're breaking down all those tiny weaker fibers and trying to replace it with healthier, stronger fibers, but you're gonna get a better shot at strength of creating new, healthy, stronger fibers by having the appropriate nutrition or building blocks available for them to piece things together and build them stronger. Yep, it's a perfect recipe. And that's why when somebody has some sort of injury, they need to have somebody really understand what's going on with it so they can diagnose where is this pain coming from, what's going on with this tissue, and then if they're going to be getting some rehabilitation, they need the dietary component addressed, and they need to make sure the rehab is really addressing things like isometric loading. Right. Yeah. That, that's why this combination really works. Is I mean, we what we generally like to see is people go through some physical therapy, but if it's plateaued or if it's not making progress, then that's when I can really help out and figure out well, why is this not getting better. Sometimes it's it's poor nutrition or bad bad building blocks. Sometimes it's that the structures are just too weak to really endure the exercise. And sometimes it's that the type of exercise that's being done isn't ideal. I mean, can you think of anything else that I'm missing? No, those are the biggest parts of it. We gotta take a look to see how are they moving, how well are they moving, and if they're doing some sort of rehabilitation, is that right for the problem at hand? Yeah. And usually those parts are not part of somebody's team planning to try to get that person to recover. Yeah, we, we always think about resolution of pain injuries from three different perspectives at the same time. One being uh, the biological system, the, the cells, how the cells interact, how they build together. Second being how the body moves, the kinesthetic, uh, the exercises, the movement. And then third being behaviors and lifestyle, fears, because a lot of people are just afraid to move. They're th they think that if they move, they're gonna break it and make it worse. But that, how often is that the case? Where they actually do break it and make it worse? Yeah. I mean, if you had a rotator cuff repair yesterday and you decided to do clapping push-ups, maybe. <laughs> you know? But for the average person, no. You'll, it'll hurt, but not harm. Okay, not everybody's a muscle man. What's a clapping push-up? Oh, we get into a push-up, then you explode forward and clap, and then go back down again? I think we need the demonstration, James. Oh, there's not enough room right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do one-legged stand-ups. Oh, All right, there at, you go. at the end, if everybody behaves, I'm going to make James do some clapping push-ups. We'll need to get a whole lot of comments on here, though, if you guys want. I'm not seeing any it. comments. So, James, I don't know if you're going to have to do this. Ah, uh, well, we'll get <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's some other things to think about for these patients right here. Yes, there was this really good recovery on here, but that was an NBA player getting all those other intangibles right. Good food, sleep, massages, that type of thing. And it took a year and a half for that level of recovery. Oh, wow. So when I'm thinking about regenerative medicine, I think about this is going to put all of these things in the right spot, but probably in a little bit sooner path that I can follow. Right. Uh, so what do you think? If you had a guy who had a patellar tendon injury, it was obviously chronic patellar tendinopathy, and they want to get back to jumping and doing big things. And, and to explain that, patellar tendinopathy, so your knee, you've got like a group of muscles in your thigh, and all those muscles come down to, we've all talked, we all know about the kneecap, right? The little bone, the round bone here. All those muscles come and attach to that kneecap. And then that kneecap changes the forces all the way down into your shin. And so patellar tendinopathy is when the tendon that goes from here, use, use uh, put a patellar tendon on my knee. 
uh, no, lower down, that's the patella. Uh, no, no, that way. All right, so that's the patella. Okay, right I didn't here. know why. Yeah. He's got really weird looking pants on. I couldn't see his legs, <laughs> it was hard. And that's the patella tendon. Like that's the, patella that's tendon. the tendon that takes the <laughs> forces from the kneecap down into the shin. And this guy can get broken down particularly in people who have like a lot of jumping, repetitive activities like that. Mm -hmm. If it's not, if your body's not prepared for that, then you can get a tear and then that tear could, could scar over and become, go that, go through that whole process that we talked about. Yeah. So somebody with patellar tendinopathy, go on. Let's say they have that, they want to recover from it, but they don't want to wait a year and a half for this thing to look like they can avoid surgery. Right. What are some regenerative options or some options that Wellward offers that can make that speedier? Yeah, so we don't even need to go to regenerative options. First thing that I would do is just do some standardized injections to disrupt the scar tissue that's forming in that, in that patellar tendon. And then combine it with the exercises that you would recommend and the collagen and nutritional elements that we, we discuss as far as like anti-inflammatory diets and collagen supplements and vitamin C to, to give the body the building blocks it needs uh, and accelerate the uptake of all those nutrients after those disruptions, those injections that will create disruption of that fibrous scar tissue. All right. And then if it doesn't get better, then we can look at some regenerative strategies which will really put a lot of growth factors and stimulation for your body to actually start layering down healthy tissue in a more aggressive manner. So we can, we can easily take something that would otherwise take like a year to build out and compress it into a span of like two or three months tops. Wow. Yeah. I like that. I got way too much stuff to do to be sitting around limping for a year and a half. And, and that's the truth for all of us. I mean, we think that yeah, that's just a minor achiness. I'll just deal with it. But the truth is we don't need to. We don't have to be just constantly putting these under the, brushing them under the carpet and waiting for it to get bad enough to do something about. It's so much easier to address it early on, get it under control so that this doesn't become that persistent problem that, that just nags us to death. Gotcha. Well, here's a question for you then. Considering some of the, the work that is done with regenerative medicine, and let's say like a stem cell implantation injury as, yeah. as an example. How do you think the collagen might help that recover? So collagen is connective tissue and cells, especially baby cells, I mean, they don't carry diapers, but they still don't have that maturity uh, that adult cells would have. They, they have to be able to stick together as a group of little kids growing up in a school that becomes healthy adults. If they don't have the proper connective tissue, it's like these little diaper baby cells are going to be floating on their own and hopefully latch onto something and be able to grow into an adult. But they're not getting the education and the, the learning and recess, how to hold hands and behave until they get the appropriate nut nutrition so that they can then cluster together and become like a school of baby cells who graduate from being diaper baby cells to like toddler baby cells to, you know, adult baby cells. I'm just imagining this playground in my knee and loving it. I know, it's <laughs> little, little amoeba looking cells just floating around. <laughs> it's good. Yeah. I like this analogy. It kind of gives me a good idea. And it, it actually, the more that I've thought about this and the more that I've researched this, I'm blown away that this is not considered for a lot of other regenerative practitioners. I mean, the thing is that in, in all of medicine, we've taken a very backwards approach to things. We wait for them to break, and then we've fixed it. And it's all this, like, you know, macho ego doctor coming in and fixing everything. We overlook how much the body can do on its own if we're giving it the resources and the tools to do so. So our role at WellWord, one of our most important roles is demystifying pain. It's helping people understand what does this pain really mean and how do we use that pain to help you get stronger, grow new tissue, go from baby diaper cells to adult uh, cohesive cells? And a lot of that comes through just simply uh, demystifying the pain, taking away the stigmas around movement and activity, and giving you the resources to really build yourself back up. And if, if it doesn't work, 
that's when regenerative medicine can really help nudge things along or accelerate it. We don't have to wait until things break beyond repair to do surgery, or we don't have to just minimize or, or, or numb the pain. We can actually do things to step forward and get, get your body to heal itself. That's pretty cool. Now, I've heard about this heal thing before. Is yeah. that part of well work? Yes. So heal is our methodology. It's what I wrote about in eh, Fifty Shades of Pain, How to Cheat on Your Surgeon with a Drug-Free Affair. Now it's, on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, it's the best seller on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, so heal stands for hearing the messages that your body's trying to convey with pain, envisioning what life is meant to be like, meaning overcoming some of the fear and the, the – uh, loss of identity as a result of pain, alleviating the symptoms, and then the most important step, leveraging what your body normally does to repair in an amplified fashion so that we can get there faster. So in nutrition, collagen, vitamin C, uh, proper exercises, these are things that will, that are the building blocks to getting us to that leveraging healing stage. I don't like hearing that. I think that, uh, I think that's the, the big thing that I wanted people to understand about collagen, that it's helpful, but it's a big part of this picture. It it's is. Not the, not the only thing. Absolutely. It's, it's every one of our techniques taken in isolation will fail. It's, it's not going to work. The, the beauty of our integrated system is that we're doing all the things in the right sequence uh, to, get that, to get that momentum of healing. It's not, all, it's not always about, like for instance, if you were to take the collagen at the end of the day and you exercise at the beginning of the day, you're not getting the full benefit of that collagen. It's not bad. It's still going to help. But you, if you can sequence it and time it appropriately following the studies that are out there, the literature that's out there, now, it, now that's when you start to really build traction. I hear so many people come in and say, oh, I've tried that and it didn't work. I've tried physical therapy and it didn't work. I, my doctor did some injections and it didn't work. And the problem with that is that they're not getting the right sequence. They're not doing it in a fully integrated, comprehensive way. They're doing just bits and pieces of it. And that builds the illusion that people are broken beyond repair. Because if medical intervention was tried and it didn't work, then it must be my body that's, that's the problem. And that's not the case. The system is just as responsible. Gotcha. Well, this is uh, definitely pretty enlightening for a lot of people. I'm hoping you appreciate it. You guys at home, <laughs> think about it. Here's the dosage, 10 to 15 grams per kilogram. I'm sorry, for the, like, the dose you're taking, about 250 milligrams of vitamin C. That's so about... repeat that yeah, yeah, and yeah. slow it down. Yeah, I like caffeine. <laughs> so if you are taking this and you're trying to help your body out, and you got a tendon injury, something like that, one hour before you do your therapy exercises, have about... 10 to 15 grams of hydrolyzed collagen with 250 milligrams of vitamin C. After that hour is up, have at it. Get that stress relaxation exercise in and go to town. And then I can have my donuts and my hot dogs and my beer and my cigarettes. That is all essential post-workout, not pre-workout. Those are not essential. <laughs> they are not. If you do all of those things, you're almost re-undoing all the damn all the good stuff that you did do. You gotta you gotta pull them in somehow. You know? <laughs> do not have the donuts and hot dogs and cigarettes and alcohol. Especially all at the same After. time. That'll taste terrible. <laughs> yeah. After a workout, yeah. You want to give your body that opportunity to use the building blocks we've given them. And I mean, you wouldn't feed alcohol to a little baby diaper child. This is the same thing. You want to really, you want to give those baby cells the best opportunity to repair. Mm -hmm. Which is why we talk about heal so much. Heal. Yeah. That's right. Well, James, I think that wraps our, our show for the day. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching Fifty Shades of Pain. Uh, sorry, the Fifty Shades of Pain show, where we examine the spectrum of shades that make up pain. Each patient is unique, and there are numerous factors that can contribute to your pain. In that spirit, we honor each and, end, each and every individual patient as an individual and tailor treatment plans specifically designed to optimize your health. Our WellWord team looks forward to partnering with you, and I'm Dr. Donish. And I'm Dr. Escaloni. And we encourage you to start your healing journey at wellwordmed.com.
Thank you.